vote for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, welcome, Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Today is Monday, June 12th, 2023. And tonight, Richard Dolan is with us. We uh, So much has gone down um, in the last seven days. A lot to talk about, and uh, which includes uh, David Grush, uh, the UAP UFO, I guess we can say UAP UFO whistleblower. Um, and that news broke last Monday. Uh, we had this. This I'm going to say it's a hoax. I don't know. Uh, this thing that happened in Las Vegas. Uh, there's a lot of media coverage um, around David uh, Grush as well. I think I said Grush, Grush. David Grush. And, of course, Dr. Stephen Greer had his press conference today from the National Press Club. And so before I just get into all of that, let's just bring in Richard and just say richarddolanmembers.com. That's my new that's my new intro for Richard Bleep and Dolan. That's it. That's it. richarddolanmembers.com. That's what we're going to do from now on. Hello, Jimmy. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm happy to be here with you. Crazy week, my friend. Okay. All right. One of the craziest ever. One of the craziest ever. And so before we get started, <laughs> the last couple of times that uh, you have been on the show, we we forgot we forgot tradition, Richard. So can can we do can we get back? We to, can. Okay, uh, really quick. We want to be efficient with our tradition. Uh, we we do. It's we, tradition. I mean, you know, we piss a lot of people off if we, you know, start changing things up. You know, they're here for a reason. They're here to find out what was the last song you listened to today. I can answer that one easily. I was driving not long before I came on here with you, and here in Rochester, we actually have a radio station that's, that I happen to like. How often do you find a radio station that you like? Not often. No. So there's one up here. They play what we like to call in the biz classic rock. You may have heard of it. I used to call it old rock to my daughter. She'd be like, Dad, I hate old rock. But it is what it is. So I was listening, and uh, this is actually not a rock song, but it's from the era. And I heard a song that I love, which is I Can See Clearly Now by Johnny Nash. One of the it's greatest one of my songs. Favorite, of it is really one of my favorite songs, and I got to hear it while driving back here. And uh, I, I love, I always love that song. Man, it, did you sing? Did you sing? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, you did. <laughs> you Alone have... in the car, I can get away with it. I can. Yeah, I can yeah, 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 yeah. For me, I listened to Boston today. Ah, uh, speaking of classic rock, right? And, and, now that's uh, true classic rock. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. I listened uh, to a bunch of stuff, but I found an a cappella version of More Than a Feeling. All right, Ooh. now that's just, no, that's just wrong. I'm sorry. I'm not going to get behind that. It's I'm live. Condemn it. I'm condemning it. No, 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 no. I'm it wagging was, the finger. It was Boston live in concert <laughs> doing More Than a Feeling a cappella. The so they were actually doing the a cappella version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah All right, yeah. fine. I guess yeah, I'm right. yeah, t- 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 Brad Delt, man, he could sing. Anyway, so that's he, what I. He was awesome. He was awesome. I, he was so awesome. And so I went through a Boston. <laughs> I went through a Boston thing today. It's just. Oh, they're uh, great. That's great. So um, uh, I didn't uh, catch all of uh, Stephen Greer's press conference. I bought. Um, a new computer. Oh, so so check this out. Well, I've been maniacally. I've, I'm up on everything, but the Greer conference. Tracy just actually caught me up to a lot of it. She, I said, I need screenshots. She's giving me screenshots. I'm looking at them. I've got his conclusions. Which, by the way, I mean, I'd love to talk about it because I'm pretty much on board with a lot of what he said there. 
Okay, so we'll circle back. Not to that. everything. I mean, not everything. The whole ET good, human bad. I got some problems with that. But a lot of the things he said actually struck me as quite uh, on the face of it, fairly reasonable. I need to listen more carefully. Okay. Um, now, it, I missed the first hour, 90 minutes or so, uh, which was Stephen today, because I bought a new computer. And I've got six computers that I use to run the show. And so I'm replacing my main one. And But check this out. So I, I go out and I get this. It's called, are you ready? It's called an mm -hmm. Omen. I got a, an Omen computer. It's by HP. But anyway. This it's not a good sign. No, no, it's not. But not check a good sign. Out. Big box, right? Big thing. This thing is it's 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 huge. It's, it, it's not. But this is the manual that comes with the computer. You open it up. You take it out. You put it down. This it is six hundred and sixty-six pages. I'm just going to guess. It's two. All right. That's oh, it. Here we are. That's it. That's the entire manual. Well, I'm, I'm very happy for you. No, it's it's just like I I like to read stuff. And I'm unpacking. I'm like, where's the manual? Dude, it's a computer. What do you need anymore? This isn't 1989. Uh, how do I operate the disk operating system here? Uh, control, Alt, Delete. You know, this is a different era. Yeah, it is. It you is. just talk to your computer. I mean, you were, we're two years away from you falling in love with your computer. Like, that's happening in your next upgrade. You're going to be like Joaquin Phoenix in the movie Her. That's, that's happening to people. Wow, I I I, I don't, you don't even need to do anything anymore. I don't normally do this, but Ron just popped up three hundred and fifty bucks, and well, just uh, just out just out. out uh, thank you, Ron. Wow, wow, that's uh, there you go. <laughs> These this is what you have when you have dedicated fate or not. Hey, you know, like I, I don't. Uh, you know, just thank you, Ron. Just thank you. That's a very humbling thing. Okay, um, let's start with uh, David Grush. Um, yeah. Now, uh, the you you were you were out of town. You were at Contact in the Desert, and um, my I was in New York. I get back from New York on Sunday night. I, I'm getting ready for the show on Monday morning, and my phone's blowing up. Like, if, right? right? And I was like, "What's what's 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 going, on? dude? Dude, 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 dude!" Right? <laughs> it was like, "What the? What's going on?" And uh, of of course, it was uh, it was justified. Uh, right. Right. It was uh, pretty incredible. Um, so take me back. Uh, let's discuss this because we're going to spend a lot of time on David tonight. But what went through your mind when you found out either somebody told you or you got texted? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll tell you the whole thing. It's actually, uh, it's funny. It's crazy. I mean, we were at contact in the desert. Tracy and I were there. This is in Palm Springs, California. It's, I think it's well, if this, maybe you could call it the largest like UFO dedicated conference out there, although there's other things out there too. Anyway, it's a big conference. It's everyone knows it. And uh, we'd had a very busy week. Uh, I gave, I was scheduled to give three lectures for that event for that week and plus two panels. I was very busy. <clears throat> and my final presentation was Monday morning or Monday early afternoon, excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. So I was getting ready to do that. <clears throat> Tracy had woken up before I, <clears throat> I did. I've got a cough. Hold on here. Uh, and my apologies. I don't know if I muted myself. It, it's yeah, you did. You did. The cough button in radio is nasty. It's the best, it's the yeah. best thing ever. Okay. Let so me, let me finish. So, so Tracy woke up. I was still lying in bed and she said, all right, you need to get out of bed now because there's all this stuff. The social media is blowing up. News is blowing up. So that was the story, and I had to change my lecture. I had a lecture on a totally different theme. So I had to dive into the uh, article by Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal at Out of the Debrief. That was a very fine article that described David Grush's allegations, which I'm sure we will get into. And I, uh, I went through it. I broke it down. I bullet pointed it, and I made about 10 slides um, for my presentation. And that's really what we did. We went in. And then the really amazing thing, just as I was walking out to, to deliver the lecture, 
I received a phone call from the organizers who asked if they could stream in the live uh, News Nation special. Like we didn't know what that was going to say, but my workshop was happening. And so we streamed that in during my workshop. So I got to see the whole thing with a crowd of about a hundred people who were staying behind at this conference. So we all got to experience it together. I was there with Danny Sheehan and um, Linda Moulton Howe was with us. This was a, a significant, like a group of, a significant group of people who were there. We got to experience it together. So that was fascinating. And in fact, let me just say this, this is a plug, but hey, um, the folks at Contact in the Desert put together, I think a 52 minute video that is a, uh, I guess you can call it a, um, a melange or a, you know, putting together of all of these different aspects of it that happened that, that morning and that afternoon. And that is on my website, Richard Allen Members. I think Tracy's putting it up. It's not high res. They didn't create a, a super high res version, but it's kind of cool. It's an interesting little slice of history there. So that's what I was doing. So I was very involved in this story <clears throat> right from the beginning because I had to be. It was like thrown right at me. And I found it absolutely fascinating. I mean, what, you know, the, I was there with Steve Bassett as well. And Steve was, was someone who said, okay, this is going to blow it wide open. The, the, the truth embargo, this is it. You know, we're going to see the avalanche happen. And uh, I will say, like, I wondered as well, like this was, because I'm sure most of your listeners are aware, but very, very briefly, Grush it's a former senior military intelligence officer, essentially stating that the U.S. government or contractors have um, <clears throat> possession of alien spacecraft and also bodies or, or at least proof of alien life, I guess. And he talked about um, <clears throat> how this information was illegal. It kept from the from Congress and from the UAP task force, how he was uh, attacked as a result of his attempts to get the, the truth out and uh, filed a formal whistleblower complaint and won his complaint. And um, I mean, it's just amazing stuff. You know, he was with the NRO, he was with the UAP task force from 2019 to 2021. So he has very good bona fides, at least to start with. And I did think like this could, this could start potentially an avalanche and it, that has not happened. Within the UFO community, there's certainly been a lot of talk. It's all that we've been talking about all week, that's for sure. Um, I was just chatting with a, a friend who is not in the UFO field, and he had not the slightest idea. Why do you think happen. that? Why do you think that is? Tucker Carlson <clears throat> um, uh, went on Twitter. You know, yeah. he's he's unemployed, so yeah, he, so he goes well, on. Twitter. He's in a good and, position to be unemployed. Yeah, he's in a. Yeah, I, I want uh, uh, control of his assets. Um, but anyway, so he goes on Twitter, and he made a very, very important point. And I, I got to thank him for this. I, I just wish it was seen by more people. He said, "Look, this is David Grush, the biggest news in human history." This is it. Why isn't it the headline story on every media platform today? He said, you can go anywhere you want and you can find out about uh, uh, politics or the economy or, or climate. Uh, but, but this story is not there. And That's right. shame on you, media. Well, and, I think there's a good reason for that. And, and why do you think that is? I think because the media is reflective of the very same power struggle that is occurring within the national security state. I've, I've been saying for years, and I, I, you know, as time goes by, I believe this more and more strongly, that what we have been seeing since 2017 is the result of a factional struggle, factional war within the establishment. And it's not that one side is like, yes, 100% for disclosure and all the, the full truth on UFOs. I don't, I do not believe that, but they do have their reasons for promoting some level of openness on UFOs and for opening up the public discussion. And they position themselves very well. We're talking Chris Mellon. We're talking, yes, Lou Elizondo, Hal Puthoff, Eric Davis, all of those guys. And then they have their allies, Leslie Kane, Ralph Blumenthal, and Tucker Carlson was an ally, you could say. 
but basically within the the uh the Pentagon itself, I think there has just, there's a faction and they may, maybe, I don't really know. I don't want to think for them, but maybe they just want to make money on uh, some of the technologies. You know, this isn't 1950 anymore. Right. We're, we're in a new century. We've gone a long road since the early days of the UFO cover up, And perhaps there are monetary opportunities in some of this technology that some people may see some way, you know, up, just make some money. Is that possible? Absolutely, that's possible. I don't know that that's their motivation. It's not as you know pure white as the driven snow in terms of motivations, but this is what motivates people. There's all kinds of reasons. But in any case, I think we've seen one faction that's promoted some level of disclosure, let's call it that, and fighting, of course, the established position, which has been entrenched for decades and generations, which is essentially saying, no way at all are we going to allow this to come out. There's just too much at stake for them. And so I think within the media, because our, our media has now become nothing more than an extension of the national security establishment. I mean, essentially, in my view, anyway. And I think that they're, you know, what you've seen the New York Times has not touched this story. The Washington Post has not touched it. The, uh, CNN, at least as of yesterday, <clears throat> has not touched the story. I, I looked, Fox has touched it a little bit, not as much as if they'd had Carlson still. They um, they had a kind of a pro article. They had kind of a negative article. There's there's really nothing in the first top tier media. You have to go to the second tier. You know, um, some of the bigger YouTube channels and um, news the salon news. covered it. The Guardian covered it. A couple of newspapers like that. Daily Mail. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. So some of them, but it's not, it hasn't made the breakthrough. And I believe most likely this is indicative of an ongoing factional war. The, the other part uh, to mm -hmm. this, uh, and there's so many, there are so many movements. And this is like a Swiss watch, right? I mean, there are so many little intricate details in here. Um, but one of the statements uh, that David uh, David Grush made um, mm -hmm. that has it's been talked about is this: he says that he gave the IG the paperwork and the images. Yes, that's right. Right now, what what is it that? Um, uh, well, well it's, it's speculate with me, right? What is it that he could have given the IG, and is it uh, does his attorney give it to the IG? Because is he allowed to be in possession of this material? So you hand it off to your attorney, attorney-client privilege. You're writing up the thing, and and you hand it off because it seems like wouldn't he be in in a weird spot? But yet. Dobser has apparently uh, allowed him to make these statements. So what what is it that he could have shown the IG? What, what, do, what do you think was so significant that convinced David to make these statements? Yeah, I'm trying to go through my notes on this as well. And I do believe he gave photographs. Mm hmm. And uh, I don't know how specific he was, actually, when he was talking with Ross Coltart about this. Uh, he mentioned documents. Uh, I don't know what specific documents he said he handed over, but I know he handed materials over to the inspector general. And, um, and you know, of course, stating that he re faced resistance, retaliation for, for uh, doing the things he did. But, I mean, presumably he... Um, I think he said he, did he say that he saw such a craft or he only had photographs? I think he said he saw photographs of the craft and gave those over and then spoke with a number of his colleagues who gave him additional confirmation of that. Yeah. So I'm going on the assumption that he gave over photographs and other kinds of assets documentation, but I don't know if we have specifics on any of that yet. Yeah, and, 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 you know, is it, and when we're talking about images, is it something from the internet that we've all seen, or is is this a photograph inside of Lockheed's hangar 
That's a great how, question. How did skunk works? Yeah, I mean, you you know, I I listened to uh, the skeptic Mick West talk about this, and I don't think he made that claim specifically about Grush, but he did say like you know he's basically recycling uh, crash retrieval stories that have been floating around the community for years. Now, what I would say is that yes, what Grush has to say does conform uh, very well with what researchers who've looked into crash UFO crash retrievals have said for years. And I'm one of those researchers. I believe that. Hey, are you there, Jimmy, or did I lose you? Uh, uh, my, my camera just stopped working. So well, I'll, I'll host your show for you. I've, I've got you covered. We'll take care of this. It just went blank. <laughs> and just, normally well, what, what I will say, but, you, you want to come uh, back on here? No, no. You can continue. What, what, yeah, I'll do this without you, Jimmy. I don't need you here. What I was going to say is, what when this normally happens, the um, uh, the there's a program running in the background that has grabbed hold of my camera. So um, anyway, is this uh, your new computer that's acting up? No, the new computer. No, this is my this is my old. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, that's weird. Okay, hold on. Let me. Yeah, well, hold on. Uh, no, no, no. I want you to continue. No, we keep can... going. Yeah, we can't have dead air. The question was, is the uh, uh, are they images like uh, we have seen from the internet? You remember when DeLong was on Joe Rogan, and he played he played that that uh, TR three B video, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's a bad moment. So that's my question: Is David handing over mm -hmm. stuff like that, or is it a, a shot from or multiple shots from inside yeah. uh, 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 a government hangar? I don't know, but I'm going to assume that he had the real deal. He had the, he has the goods. And the reason I'm assuming that is because uh, at this point, I have a high level of trust. I'm going to say that in, in the journalism of Leslie Kane and of Ralph Blumenthal. Um, oh, spoken with Ralph uh, a bit. I think right. they know what they're doing. I think that they, um, you know, I've listened to particularly Leslie talk about this in the last week. I think they vetted Grush very well. I know that David Grush has a very high stellar reputation where he has worked. He received uh, significant promotions due to his excellent capability. Hey, there you are. Welcome back. Welcome back to the program, Jimmy Church. I feel better. So, um, so I'm going to take it. I'm assuming, but I admit, I don't know that he had the real deal that he had actual images that were legit, not just some rehashed stuff. But <clears throat> what I was saying before is that what he has claimed is very much in line with what has circulated through the UFO research community. But that's not, that's not something that should be used to discredit him for goodness sake. Uh, I've spent years and years going through the research of the late Leonard Stringfield from the 1970s through the early 90s. I know strength builds work very well at this point. I've spent a lot of time going into everything that he has done. And I will just say that Leonard Stringfield was a meticulous researcher who went out of his way to get uh, detailed accounts from a wide range of witnesses who talked about the retrieval of UFOs and, and alien bodies as well. Stringfield collected a lot of this. So the you know, that's a massive of testimony that has already existed. And Grush is indeed providing evidence, or at least he's providing testimony, I should say, that is that corroborates or that supports the work of people like Leonard Stringfield. But yeah, it's true, me, like the critics me, have said, Grush doesn't have proof. He's not presented proof. And that is that's an issue. Well, and let me jump in. Um uh, I have my old copy that I, I got from you years ago, UFOs and National Se Security State, Volume 1, and I'm constantly picking that book up and, 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 and reading it. It's like one of my reference books. And just last night, so you're bringing up Stringfield last night, um, I decided to start from the beginning again, and I'm re and I caught I didn't see this before. You do a section before Roswell, right? Okay, 
And it's not very long, but uh, he do the the airship stuff, eighteen ninety seven, and 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 things. But anyway, mm. you talk about Foo Fighters, and you talk yeah. about this case in the Pacific, where this troop transport is is flying. That's right, Springfield and, was there. But and and, and I'm, I'm saying, so I'm reading. I'm like, oh, okay, Foo Fighters, Pacific Three, okay, following and it disappeared in the cloud. And then you you you, you got this. It's almost a throwaway line at the end of it, where you go. And by the way, one of the troops on that plane was a young Leonard Stringfield. That's Holy right. Crap, right. Not only that, that account he wrote about it in. Um... Trying to remember which book, probably Situation Red. I can't remember, but he described it at some length and he said, Yeah, we were, uh, can't remember exactly where they were. They were moving, I flying toward Japan, I think. And this luminous tear, teardrop shaped object came alongside their plane and immediately caused the plane to start to sputter. The engine started to go out. That's right. That's right. Right. And right. they were preparing. He said, We had to prepare for a ditch, like to ditch the plane in the ocean. Good Lord, they were that it was that serious. And he said the uh, this bright object then just moved away from our aircraft and we came back to got normal. The back. Yeah, got the engines back. Um, uh, yeah, it dashed into some clouds, right? Disappeared. <clears throat> yeah. And and they got the engine back and, and all was all was cool. But that was but in, in August or September, I think August of 1945. I think it was after the, the bombs had been dropped on Hiroshima in August. Yeah. Three weeks after. after. Yeah. 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 So who's who's flying those things? If you want to argue, like and we can get this into this with, with Greer's press conference later because he does well, he makes the claim, of course, that I mean a lot of these things are man-made. He does state that, that some of these are ET, but a lot are man-made. But he said like the tic tac is man-made. And but is that Foo Fighter from Stringfield's encounter from after the Japanese surrender? Is that man-made? Who's flying those things? That's right. I mean, look, it's, right. we're not talking German Nazi technology, and we're not talking Japanese. This is this is does not have an explanation. I'm just saying. So, what do you what do you make of? Uh, uh, do you feel that Grush? I I, I, I want to talk about Dopser too. I, I think this is very important because he. The the takeaway is this: flying saucers, alien bodies, right? That's the that's the right? that's that's the two things that that are on point here. Um, it did is is these uh, these two subjects yeah. were these disclosed to Dobser, right? These are what this is what I'm going to write about. This is what I'm going to talk about in interviews. I'm going to talk about uh, the U.S. government having, uh, you know, crashed and recovered alien uh, flying saucers. And mm-hmm. I'm going to talk about uh, alien bodies and the pilots of those said craft. And yeah. was that cleared by the government? And- yeah, I don't know. And I'm going to need to have more time to look into Dobser myself. I'm just going to plead that I haven't caught up on every single development. There's been so much this week. I mean, I'm aware that there have been claims of alien bodies in possession of um, possessed by the United States government or contractors. So, I mean, first of all, I I personally absolutely believe such things. I have believed this for a long time. Right, right. That, uh, do you, that do we you, have alien bodies and technology. Yes. Do you, do you put David Grush at whistleblower status? I think so. I think it's fair. Um, I mean, he had he did apply for protection formally under the Whistleblower Protection Act. So, um, yeah, and I, I mean, Leslie and Ralph refer to him as a whistleblower. I mean, not, that phrase often gets overused, especially in the UFO field. It's overused right. all the time. But to me, what constitutes a, a whistleblower is, <clears throat> well, first of all, you have to be able to confirm who they are. And we can do that with him. And secondly... They are literally drawing attention to a specific problem within the government. One thing Grush did not do, which I think at some point someone needs to do, is to identify the office or some office that is actually managing this cover-up, which he has not done, to my knowledge, Uh, or even the name. Like, we need, you know, departments and names. And 
until we get that, I, I think there's going to be a great deal of, um, of question and skepticism yeah, but, that's still yeah. being levied there. So um, the we're, we're getting closer <clears throat> and closer, right? We are moving the ball down the field. But your point is a valid one. You can say that we are in possession of flying saucers. You can say that we have the, but, but it is a whole nother step. And, and, and if once you've applied for whistleblower status, then go there. Is it Raytheon? Right? Is it, right, exactly. is it is it Boeing? Is it is it Lockheed? Is it Northrop Grumman? Who- I think I think the, the money is that it's actually all of them because when you've got uh stovepiping that's been going on with this type of program, you you actually want to spread it around a little bit because you don't want all of the data to be contained within one particular corporate entity. So I mean this is what I have heard for some time and it makes sense to me, right? Yeah. Not just it, one place, it, not just Northrop, not just Lockheed and so forth. Is he uh, <clears throat> now Leonard Stringfield, military, right? Um, yeah. uh, many, uh, Robert Salas, right? Mm-hmm. We can, uh, that many uh, military uh, personnel have, have come forward. Um, over the years. Um, Grush is certainly not the first one, but um, his, not only his military background, but his clearances, uh, the UAP task force, um, is it the NRO, right? I I, I think he... That's right, NRO. um, This is is pretty heavy. Now we're in heavy duty uh, territory here. Why would he not be telling the truth, right? Ross, Ross asked one of the best questions ever, and he is good. Ross Coulthard. Mm -hmm. He goes, he looks right at him and goes, dude, are you lying to me? Right. And, and so to that, that's the question. Why, if if you have the career that you have and you have the reputation that you have, why would you throw it all away? I I, I don't think that you would. I I, no. I just don't. <clears throat> I think this is why most people consider him very credible. And let's just be clear: I think most people do consider him to be credible. He's got some detractors, of course. It's going to happen when you're making a claim like this, but I think. Um, he has. He seems to have an excellent reputation. Um, he comes across as a young guy to me. You know, he's thirty six. I think he's almost sounds a little flippant when he talks with Ross Coltart a little bit. That just may be his age. Uh, nothing wrong with that. He he seemed very forthright overall. And uh, what do you think about his demeanor? His body language. Um, uh, it, it, you, you, I know there's been a few people who've like <clears throat> tried to analyze his body language. I've seen a couple right. of uh, attempts for that, and I, I don't really know what I think about that. Um, I think some of like I, you know you see him shaking his head sometimes when he's saying something positive and affirmative, but I think that it struck me as just like he's looking at the incredulity of the whole thing. Like I, I, I didn't find his body language to be a problem. I just found him to be. He's a young guy, you know, he's a young guy who has um, a certain demeanor that you would see from a younger guy, not an older guy. That's about it. But I I didn't find him uh, clearly deceptive in in his demeanor as I looked at him. One of the things um, that you uh, like to say and have said over the years, right? We, we can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Yeah. And and if we go back to December of 2017, New York Times, it's Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal. Here we are five and a half years later. It's Leslie and Ralph again, right? Yep. Uh, yep. A complete grand slam home run, bottom of the ninth in the World Series. Uh, it, it, twice. It doesn't happen in, in journalism uh, that often. Um, when, when Leslie uh, was asked about uh, the vetting of sources and, and looking at documents, um, she looked straight at the camera and said, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a professional. 
and I have my relationships and, and I know what's going on and I've researched this and, and Ralph and I are not going to publish something that, that we're not going to stand behind. I, you can't really say it better than that. Can you? No. There's something else about this story that I don't know if I've heard anyone <clears throat> uh, state explicitly, but I think we all kind of implicitly understand, which is this article crosses the red line. It does. This is the red line of disclosure, which is the allegation that the United States government has acquired technology from extraterrestrials, aliens. And the reason it's a red line is that it proves, if it's true, it proves that there has been a longstanding cover up and deception by the United States government against the people of the United States and the world. And this is. You know, when when uh, when those two did their articles for The New York Times, including their final one for The New York Times, which was in July of 2020. And that was an interesting one because they quoted Eric Davis, Dr. Davis, at length in that or at least at some length. And see that, anyone remembers that he, he came. See that? See that? Yes. That, that says Eric Davis. That, right. that was my next about. point. <laughs> that, that, well, yeah, but the, the thing is, right. In 2020, they quoted Davis and. And in that article, they came within a, the, bre the breadth of a human hair of going over that line and basically saying, yeah, there's been retrieval of, of alien technology. They didn't quite do it. They came very, very close. That was in the New York Times. And uh, I think, you know, I think we've heard that they initially wanted the New York Times to do this story and the New York Times passed on it. And that makes sense to me as well. Because the New York Times is still very much an uh, instrument for the establishment. And they are still very much in bed with the intelligence community and the national security community. And uh, clearly there's enough loyalty in there for them not to run this story. Because this shows the United States government to be engaged in a, well, in a 75 plus year long conspiracy against the truth and against, against its own principles of transparency in government. Like they've just lied. They've lied. And, and we are, you know, I've said this many times, but we are in an era, Jimmy, where you and I and all listeners are not supposed to believe in conspiracy theories. There is a concerted effort going through Google's helping with, all, you know, the uh, intelligence community to do this, to, to search for what they call conspiracy theories at scale. That is, they're scouring the web using, <clears throat> and you could, uh, we have to assume using extremely advanced AI algorithms now to disable shadow ban and, you know, minimize what they consider to be conspiracy theories. And yet what's, what's a bigger conspiracy theory than the UFO cover up? Maybe nothing, probably nothing. And so this, the article by Leslie and Ralph Ross's interview that followed up uh, some of the other journalism that's come out. I was looking at an article by a, uh, I didn't know this man, Michael uh, Schellenberger on a Substack, which talks about, um, you know, witnesses talking about that 12 to 15 alien craft in possession, uh, possessed by the U.S. government or contractors. I don't know where his sources are, but again, uh, this I think is this kind of stuff floating around in, in um, congressional testimony. So, so these types of stories that are now filtering out, the, the real question is going to be, will they get mainstream establishment traction? And will CNN and the New York Times cover it? Will the Washington Post cover it? Because if they do, it's going to be, well, it's going to be very interesting to see how they handle it. Are they going to, if, if they don't debunk it, if they don't debunk Grush and what he's saying, they are opening the door for a massive reevaluation of the last 80 years of history. We are this close to that. We are very close to a tremendous reevaluation of our entire history of the 20th century onward. And we're not, we're not there yet because we're still at the, he said, she said phase. Like, is it true? Is it not true? Is he real? Is he BS? Whatever. But we're getting really close. And if, you know, I really do wonder, is this an avalanche moment? Are we looking at this? Are, because right now it's Grush. And, but there's other whistleblowers. Well, okay. <laughs> let, me, let me stop you right there for a second. Yeah. Um, it is 
huge news. But it's another the, one of the points that has has come out is that this information that convinced David Grush to to come out as a, as a whistleblower is now in the hands of Congress. It is now in the hands of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Right. Um, they have both houses have now gone on the record saying that they are scheduling hearings now. Yeah, this is this is significant because what we've had up till now are not hearings. No, no, no. And 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 it was never we've had briefings. Bodies. It was never alien bodies and flying saucers. That's right. I, Andre Carson. The last actual <laughs> hearings we had were in 1968, man, a long time, long time ago. So that, those were hearings. We have not had hearings since then. We've had right. briefings and they were, you know, very low level, often kind of boring and that type of thing. So this is different. And actually, I was just going through my notes on Schellenberg's piece. Uh, and I'm just going to write like basically what he was saying is that there have been many sources, including high ranking intelligence officials and former intelligence officials who have come forward to support Grush's claim, claims. And they apparently, and this is a collective, I don't have any names here. I don't think there's any names out, but they have said that the government and military contractors have at least a dozen or more alien craft. I think six were said to be in pretty good condition. Six were said to be uh, pretty badly damaged. And maybe there's a couple more. So, so I, all of this is ready to come out. Like, I, I mean, can this right, come out in hearings? Right, 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 right. I, 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 I um, check this out. <clears throat> Um, Jim Shell, a former chief scientist of the Space Innovation and Development Center at Air Force Space Command, wrote on LinkedIn last week to support David Grush. Hmm. Shell wrote on LinkedIn, and this is this is a direct quote. Are you ready? Quote. Sure. I will vouch for the integrity of Dave Grush. Getting to the bottom of this is elusive and problematic, to say the least. I will assert, no matter the conclusion of extraterrestrial materials or not, the DOD and the IC security apparatus is in trouble, and unwitting accomplices are fostering an abusive system. End quote. Holy crap. Yeah. That's He's where being nice by saying unwitting. Yeah. I'm sure they're not all unwitting. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. Yeah. But but that's where we are. And so these that's a substantial hearings, statement. That's important. Yeah, that's a, 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 extremely substantial. Yeah. And so these hearings are is this going to be like um, you know, when Howard Hughes was in front of the Senate and he's got his attorney next to him whispering in his ear and they're covering the microphone and you've got 600 people packed in the, the, the chambers and, it, you know, <clears throat> you can think about Watergate or, yeah. or you know, these other, um, uh, you know, Howard Hughes. What was the that scene from uh, God, uh, Godfather Part Two? right? <laughs> you know what I mean? The, I the, remember that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it... <clears throat> Do you think it's going to be a media circus like that? Uh, I, I, will, I don't know. I don't know, man. I do not know. Because as I was saying earlier, I, I was just chatting with a friend this evening. He had not the slightest idea that this was going on. And he's a smart guy. He just, you know, didn't follow this. So I think there's a lot of people out there. Like we're, we are in our little UFO bubble, our UAP bubble. We can call it that. We, those of us, who follow this, we live it, we breathe it, but there's a big world out there. And I still think there's many, many people who are not very up to date with what's going on. So it's entirely possible. I mean, it's crazy to say this, but I see it as possible that we could have hearings, real hearings. And will people really know how many people back in the late sixties knew that there were congressional hearings on UFOs back then. I don't know, actually, but probably many did not. These things just go by the board. I mean, if you're interested, you can follow it. The real thing will be, I think the only thing that will change this is, <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's what Steve Bassett has been saying all along. If the president of the United States says it, I think honestly, that is like the only, the only thing that's going to change this. And I don't know what else really will do it. 
Maybe, maybe there's a couple of halfway points. So for example, if there really is powerful testimony that is given during the hearings, um, maybe that will cause a, a, a quickening of the boulder going down the hill. But I, I just think, I, I mean, our media, our government has done an incredible job at stonewalling on all kinds of issues and not just stonewalling, but just out and out lying. So, you know, it really depends on how this factional war ends up. I think if if they're able to stonewall this for another decade, they'll just they'll do it. They'll stonewall as long as they as long as they can. I think there there's got to be a monetary interest big time in maintaining this secret. There's got to be. There have got to be powerful. You know, you think about the contractors that undoubtedly have access to this, this technology or these craft, and they have got to want to maintain a monopoly over possessing this stuff. If if you're if you've got this magical future technology in your possession, why would you ever want to share that with anyone else? This is like your magical secret weapon for the future. You can it gives you all kinds of ideas and power and technology. You don't want to share that. Never want to share that. So I think it really will come down to who is the stronger faction. That's what I think, because I don't know if truth is really going to make a difference here. I think it's which faction in our national security power structure is able to get the upper hand here. And it, you know, we're at a point where for the first time, uh, maybe in a long, long while, maybe ever, it does look possible for the side of UFO openness uh, and ending of what, what Steve always calls the truth embargo, that that may, you can actually see it happening. You can see it as a possibility. After that, what then? That's a whole other can of worms, but it's at least possible. It's kind of an amazing thing to see. Did you... Uh, um, uh, uh, there always has to be somebody first, right? No matter what, there's got to be somebody to open the first door. It's got to be somebody's got to walk in. Somebody's got to be the first one to test out the new roller coaster, right? Somebody's mm-hmm. there's, a, there's a first, you know. And did you picture the first, you know, in this situation to be somebody like a David Grush who is uh, credentialed, his CV, his uh, his resume is right there. We yeah. we know everything. Did you picture that? Yeah. And, 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 it, well, you you were telling me you love reading uh, volume one of UFOs and the National Security State, which or which thank you by the way. But I I did another book with Bryce Zabel called AD After Disclosure, and that was in 2010. We wrote that book 13 years ago, and we I'm going to tell you looking back over it. It's kind of amazing. It was a different world in 2010, a very different world. But what we tried to do was to kind of game play out uh, how could UFO secrecy end? What what factors could spark this? And and then of course most of our book was on what would happen if that if that were to occur. Well, how would that affect our society? But one of the ways that we we saw a few things that could cause a, a kind of cracking of the ufo wall of secrecy one was a a major sighting that was like our major that was our first choice uh two i'm trying to think back was like a wikileaks type of a thing you know where uh, a leak comes out right but but one of them that we did absolutely talk about was the possibility of a of a credible government insider who decided to go public this is something that we really wondered at the time we're like you know someone of the stature of like colin powell like like highest level, like joint chiefs of staff. Uh, I don't think that Bryce or I were actively thinking of kind of a, a lower level, a mid-level intelligence officer like like uh, Grush, but frankly, he fits the bill. He has he has sufficient credentials to be able to have that uh, armor, that public armor, to go out and make the statement that he did. So I think, yeah, we did. Um, when we wrote after disclosure, this was one of the scenarios we looked at. Do you think that, um, okay, so we have 
We have three basic branches of, of government. We're not going to get into uh, uh, a class on politics right now, but we have three branches of government, right? And when we deal with the representative side of it, we have uh, a couple of different houses and, and, and local governments and so forth. But it appears that... Um, the way that this is playing out is that none of those branches, the judicial, the executive, right, that nobody knew about any of this. And that is what is so surprising that I think there are certain expectations um, <clears throat> that you are uh, you are allowed access to just about anything if you have the clearances for that and you can get questions answered. This situation uh, with Grush coming forward that we have flying saucers and we have alien bodies that nobody knows about this and they were assuming that they should. And Man. that is where the heart attacks are happening, right? Our government is like a dead body you find on the side of the road. You walk along the sidewalk, and you see this dead guy there, and you're like, oh, wow, looks like a dead person. You take a little stick and you poke it, and he's not moving. But then you think, oh, but he's wearing the same clothes I saw him wearing yesterday. He must be fine. That's our government. We have the trappings are the same as they've always been. You have presidency, the executive branch. You've got the Congress. You've got the judiciary. They're all still there. The body just happens to be dead. And just like in the movie Alien, you got the thing growing inside the body about to come out. That's what we have. And we have had that, we have had that definitely since the end of the Second World War. And you could even make an argument that it started earlier than that. But what we have is an, an empire. We have a national security empire. This is why they killed Kennedy, my friend. I mean, you think about it. I don't want to make this whole thing about Kennedy, but just stop and think. Those guys not only killed the president in basically what was a coup, but then they killed the guy that they framed to kill him. And then they killed the guy who killed the guy that they framed to kill him. And they killed the journalist who interviewed the guy who killed the guy who framed, who was framed to kill, like Dorothy Kilgallen. They killed uh, everyone else involved, like David Ferry, and they killed Mary Pinchot Meyer, who was one of the lovers of John F. Kennedy. Like they killed everyone. They killed everyone and they got away with it. That's our government, my friend. That is what we have. And we do, to this day, we don't talk about that. We can't have an honest conversation. But this is what we have. It's a mafia state. Sorry to sound so hyperbolic here. But what else can it be when you get away with a crime like that against John F. Kennedy? And so these are the people running our show. And all of the, the executive, legislative, judicial branch, yeah, they're not totally dead. Okay, maybe I overstated it a little bit. They still can kind of function and do certain things. But fundamentally, who's actually running it? We have an empire to run here. They're running a global empire where we've got military bases, 800 bases in countries around the world. This is what it is. This is not, it's like with Rome. Rome started as a republic. It was very well designed, their system for Romans living in Rome. Then they get an empire. And suddenly the Senate's like, how do we run this? They can't. They, they're not equipped. It's the same with our system. Our system of government was, is not equipped to run a global empire, which is now crumbling, by the way. So so this is not our the, the fifth grade civics class lesson that we all get. You know, we got the president, we got the executive, uh, the judiciary. Yeah, that's that's fairy tale stuff. That's not our actual. In fact, one of the problems we have in this world of ours, in our society, is we don't really understand what form of government we have. We don't really understand it. What the hell do we have? Who's running this thing? So we don't have an honest conversation about where the true nexus of power happened to be. And so this is one reason it's hard to figure out the UFO cover up, by the way. Where is the power? Is it within the office of the president? Well, <clears throat> no. It isn't. You know, we talked about the whole Davis Wilson notes, uh, you know, the last couple of years. What does that prove? It, it shows absolutely that formal, the formal branch of government, in this case, the Department of Defense and the Joint Chiefs of Staff, 
fundamentally was locked out of the UAP reverse engineering program that was dominated by contractors. Sure, there was a couple of DOD guys who were like liaisons and officially overseeing it, but you really can see in the notes themselves, DOD almost had, had really nothing to do with this. They were just rubber stamping these operations. These were all private contractors who ran it all. And, and this well, is what- That's our system. And, hmm? and, and, and that's what is uh, surprising so, so much of uh, Capitol Hill that they did they don't know the facts they don't understand they mm -hmm. don't know these things if you go back to the wilson davis document one of the most important points in that which now capitol hill is finding out the hard way is they told they told thomas wilson they go dude do whatever the f you want that's right, <laughs> we that's don't right. crap they were go, not scared go, yeah yeah Go, go yell, go cry, go back to Washington and talk to whoever you want. Bye. <laughs> right. And that's exactly what's going on. And, and, and Capitol Hill is finding out the hard way. What? Yeah. We've got flying saucers. What? Well, the hearings, hearings would be a fantastic thing. I, I would love to see hearings and apparently it looks like they may happen. So if they're done well, there are hearings that can be done well. Uh, there's the famous 1975 church committee hearings on the intelligence community. And, and uh, they didn't really do a whole lot, but, but they were great in the sense that they, a lot of information came out. And if we have something where. Well, that, well uh, for everybody, let's not get into a history lesson, but when it came to MK ultra and, and the evidence of that and what the church hearings brought forward, every IC agency in the country that was <laughs> started shredding documents. Yeah. Right. And, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, and, and, and some, some of those documents survived, mm -hmm. uh, which allowed those hearings uh, to go forward. But the thought of MK ultra, no, our government would never do that. No, and right, it turned exactly. out one of the craziest conspiracy ideas of all time was true. Exactly. That's, that's right. That, that's what the that's church right. hearings did. And could it, could it, could we revisit this? I, I, I think, think we, it's possible. Um, how motivated are people like Rubio or Gillibrand in, in really pursuing this matter? I mean, I don't really know. They've, uh, for politicians, they talk a bit of a game. They do. Do they mean it? Will they really go forward with this? And I would like to see. Or Burchett, you know, uh, some of these people who are really into the subject or seem to be into the subject. So it would be, um, it'll be an interesting thing. And I don't know how to predict any of this. Uh, you know, I look at the past. I'm not, I don't know how good I am at predicting the future. Uh, certainly not political outcomes like this. This is, we're just going to have to watch it happen, I suppose. But I do think there's a lot of interesting potential here. And if there are genuine hearings that are held, well, this is not something that we have had in more than 50 years in this country. And and as you were saying earlier, I totally agree with you, like that the subject matter has gone way far beyond where it was in 1968 when this was done last. And And, and when you're talking about retrieval of technology and to say nothing of bodies, well, it's impossible to avoid the notion of cover-up. Then what they're going to have to do is go into PR mode and CYA mode, and they'll just have to come up with the best explanations that they can for lying to the public, which, of course, they're going to do. They'll say, you know, well, it was a matter of national security. This was a really dangerous thing. Um, and, and, you know, the, the questions are just going to begin. We, we think it's complicated now. You know, all of us, you know, I've been... I've been studying UFOs for almost 30 years now, and it's been, it's complicated. It will go 10 times more complicated if there is even the slightest admission of the reality of this, because then we're going to start getting into the real issue where the rubber meets the road, which is who are these beings? How long have they been here? What are they doing? Has the United States government or any other government collaborated with them in any way? Such, such statements in the past were seen as outrageous. 
well, it's suddenly not so outrageous now if we discover that we've got one or a dozen or 15 of their craft. It's not that outrageous. The story of, uh, you know, um, Bill Uhouse, late Bill Uhouse, who talked about, you know, J-Rod and, and, and creating, uh, you know, testing flying saucer craft back in the 60s and 70s. Is that so outrageous now? Strawberry ice cream. <laughs> oh my God! You remember that, that whole thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you, a whole other. Yeah. You you brought up a point. I've I've got a, a break for a commercial, but um, uh, before we get there, and then when we come back, we'll talk about Stephen Greer and some other stuff. Sure. Um, is is you mentioned, and I agree with you that so many out there, um, the only thing that is good enough, no matter what. Is the, the the president doing the live thing from the Oval Office, right? I, su- I suspect so. If if that doesn't happen, what about um, uh, uh, members of Congress or or the Senate um, getting getting access and 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 going in and seeing these craft for themselves and seeing the the alien bodies for themselves and then coming back and saying okay all right yeah we, we've seen the craft um is that is that good enough is if, is if, well i guess it could be if if that's actually if they are allowed to make a statement in advance of the president they're kind of jumping over some lines here in terms of protocol, right. it seems to me. Right. Uh, but if if that is the case, uh, I I don't know. I don't know what the uh, the protocols would be on that. But I know. And do you invite yeah. the press in? Right. All right, Anderson Cooper, come on in, and uh, you can do uh, CNN live from in front of, uh, the sport model. You know, that would really suck. Honestly, I know you got to go to commercial. So when you come back, maybe I'll tell you why I think it would suck if that were to happen. Let's take our break. Our guest tonight, Richard Dolan. We're talking about one of the craziest weeks. I know I didn't, I didn't think, you know, Richard, uh, December, 2017, kind of mm-hmm. hard to top. And then you and I got together in Los Angeles the day of the UAP task force report being released. Oh, that's right. And and that's we right. were we were filming a, a movie yeah. um, in Los Angeles right. while that broke. That's so right. uh, you had said earlier at at contact in the desert that you and you know and and everybody got to sit down and talk through this. Well, we did the same thing. It was you. Uh, Willie Streber, Linda Moulton Howe, uh, William right. Henry, myself. Um, am I leaving somebody off of the list uh, of the of the public speakers? I think you got them all, and there were we had some very very cool production people who were there as well. Right. But we were able to sit and talk through this, and yeah. you know what a what a what a moment that was. And I feel like we're going through another one of those moments. Uh, oh. It's been it's been a crazy week. I'm all right, bigger. Yeah, let's say, exactly. Let's take a break. Our guest tonight, Richard Dolan. I am Jimmy Church. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below, and we'll be right back. Join us November 10th, 11th, and 12th, 2023 as Disclosure Fest Foundation and Fade to Black Radio presents Stairway to the Stars, a human origins, science, and technology expo live at the Luxor Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip with live talks, lectures, and workshops by world-acclaimed researchers and authors. This is Jimmy Church, by the way, and I'll be your host all weekend long. Featuring topics like human origins, ancient technologies, in indigenous teachings, workshops, a mass meditation, yoga and sound healing, music, and so much more. Don't miss our intimate sky watch and meteor shower over the infamous Area 51 airspace in Rachel, Nevada, with special surprise celebrity host guiding us through the night. Also introducing our Disclosure Fest VR Starship Area with dozens of rides. You've got to check it out. This event will sell out. For more information and tickets, please visit Disclosure 
The secret is out. LifeWaves X39 is the reason why I have got my vision back. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you need to go straight to HealingWorksNow.com. That's HealingWorksNow.com. Works with an X. All of the information that you need is on that portal. Find out why I look great. I feel great. I'm thinking clearly. I sleep. I dream. Life is good. All of it. You've got to check out Life Waves X39 and all of their other products. It's all simple to do. Go to HealingWorksNow.com. That's HealingWorksNow.com. Works with an X. Hey everybody, it's Billy Carson, also known as Forbidden Knowledge. I want to talk to you about a very special event coming up July 30th, 2023, the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We're going to honor people who have been contributing to the conscious community for decades. People that you know and love that have helped you get to higher levels of thought and consciousness and awareness. It's going to be a live in-person event, but seats are going to sell out very fast. You want to make sure you're there in person. And guess what? You can help vote for the winners. Voting is available on ForbiddenKnowledge.com. And the categories are going to be social media influencer, podcast slash radio host, TV host, actor, director, producer, entrepreneurs, health and wellness, philanthropists, authors, field researchers, archaeologists, space anomaly hunters, and of course, a lifetime achievement award. I'll be your key note speaker that night at the Forbidden Conscious Awards. We have celebrity guests performing. We'll have a halftime show where we're actually going to perform music for you. And don't forget about the pre-event mixer where if you buy a box seat, you'll be in the VIP section and you also have private access to a VIP mixer with celebrity guests. Shake hands, break bread, network, and then walk the red carpet with us and take amazing photos. It's going to be a night to remember. You don't want to forget this. Make sure you hurry up and get your tickets because they're selling out very fast. I want to see you there for Bid and Conscious Awards 2023. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Richard Dolan is with us. An exciting week, uh, not only uh, for the UFO community, but for the world. Uh, we have a whistleblower, his name is David Grush, uh, who came forward and the news broke last Monday. Um, and the developments throughout the week with uh, Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal's article on the debrief um, and the other media outlets, some have been slow to respond. Uh, I, I think it's starting to get traction, but also what is going on in Washington, D.C. And then we had, of course, Las Vegas. Uh, <laughs> and I, I called Richard. Uh, and I said, hey, Richard, hey, man, have you have, have you seen this video in Las Vegas? A- anyway. Um, before the, so we had that. And then today, Stephen Greer had his live, uh, press conference event at the national press club in Washington, DC before the break, Richard, I asked, should, should CNN or, or Fox oh, yeah. or ABC, you know, do a live event, you know, oh, here we are. Well, it, I mean, it would be kind of, it was like the dream that we all had for years and years and decades and decades. But now that we have like a Soviet level system of media, it just really takes the wind out of the sail. Like it just is a horrible, like you would have liked to have had this when we actually had a functioning, genuinely free media. That's not just a mouthpiece of the establishment, essentially the way Pravda was for the Soviet state, you know, for decades in, in the old days, which is really what we have. So that's why it would, suck in that sense but uh this is what we have this is our awful awful terrible media system and you know the 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 problem with it is simply that these people i just have to say are incapable of telling the truth on almost anything i don't think it's in their dna so i don't um i think that if if there's a disclosure coming out there it's just going to be filled with spin spin and more spin 
Okay, so then what is the safe road here? Is it like Running Man, right? Are we gonna Are we gonna have TMZ, right? Broadcast? No, I, no, I hear you. I hear you. I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's not a good solution here. I guess the best solution would be if uh, the major media outlets all were to try to cover this, and genuinely were trying to compete to get to the truth, and and were pressured from below by the second tier media and the people. And if some kind of magical combination that this could cause our media to ask some hard questions, not only about the nature of extraterrestrials and the whole presence of them here, but their own culpability in this cover-up, because this is the thing. One of the reasons we've had, you know, 80 years of deception and lies on this is because the American and global Western dominated and global media establishment have been complicit in this. We know this. Hell, they go to the Bilderberg meetings every year. I mean, this is, they're part of it. And so how, how do we expect any level of good faith in actual genuine reporting when they haven't given this to us in a whole lifetime? on UFOs and, and everything else. So that's the problem. I mean, there's there's no good solution out of it. Uh, you know, again, I'm referring back to our, our book, After Disclosure, that uh, I, I co-authored. And the situation was bad in 2010. I mean, it's much worse now, but it was bad then. And uh, I admit a, let, a little bit of the book had some hope in it. And the hope was that the shock of something so big as a genuine UFO disclosure, a revelation that this is real, aliens are here, we've got their stuff, that that would cause a kind of cultural and social and even political revolution of sorts. Not necessarily a violent revolution, but some something in which we confront the lies that we have told ourselves as a society for so long. That's not an easy thing to do. It's very difficult for anyone, I don't care who you are, to have to confront a lifetime of fables and fictions that you've been living. That's not easy. It's not easy to confront that. And that's what this reality is demanding of us. It is demanding that we confront the lies that we've either told or just accepted. And in either case, it's just not easy to do. Do we do we lack that uh that talking head that we that there was trust in right where uh, where we had we do uh, yeah we do yeah we, we do. don't we don't have that good night and good luck you know yeah. we, we you know we we don't have we we lack that today uh, is there any is there any trust in the media anymore? And as a matter of fact, uh, Richard, I want to get to uh, uh, Stephen Greer's uh, uh, conference today. But yeah. um, the uh, the news has gone from presenting news to opinions, right? Oh, and yeah. that, that's that's a very strange term. Well, the whole business model is different. Right. Has, you look at the New York Times and how it's just degraded over the years. I mean, it's a, a pale imitation of what it once was. And the reason is that the New York Times has realized in this age of digital media, they have to appeal to their base market, which is in their, this a political spectrum. They have to appeal to a political spectrum. In the old days, it was, well, we're going to try to appeal to a broad base of people. That's what many of them did. That's not what they do any longer. So it does I mean, we all realize, you know, if we graduated from high school, or, <laughs> we realize that every there's spin everywhere. Like there, there's no such thing as total objectivity. It's it's a it's an illusion, but that doesn't mean one can't strive for some level of objectivity. You it doesn't mean you can't strive to try to see more than one point of view of a of a problem. Like that's a good thing. You want to see multiple angles of it, and and you have a better chance of understanding it. And we don't do that. We do not do that. So is that is okay. that why is that <laughs> why it, it took the debrief, you know, to release this story, you know that the, like Tucker Carlson said, you know, uh, this is this is the biggest news in the history of mankind, 
you know, where mm. is the responsible media right now? Where it's utterly is- corrupt and captured. That's right. where it is. Right. And 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 Tim McMillan and and Micah Hanks and everybody over it and uh, over at the de- the debrief. Uh, of course, they understood the importance of the story, but they don't have to go through. Uh, the the journalistic processes, I say journalistic uh, in in air quotes, right. uh, that the New York Times or Fox or whoever, uh, Los Angeles Times, uh, would have to go through that bureaucracy and and journalism and reporting by committee, right? Because that's, right. that's what you have to go through these days. And it takes something like the debrief, a streamlined not worried about let's just let's report and and present the story yeah. your modern version of the old muckrakers of over a century ago you know in the early 20th century there were newspapers in the united states that they were called muckrakers raking up the muck you know getting into the dirt looking into all of the things that the established uh, publications, you know, were that was beneath the established publications. So you, it was left to smaller, much more gritty and aggressive newspapers back in those days to look into some of these things. And I think the debrief, I think they've earned the right to be called that. And that that's a good thing. A yeah. good thing to be called a modern right. muckraker. They're small, they're scrappy. Uh, they've been, I've seen them already being insulted by uh, some of the people who are trying to debunk this whole story. Um, as low level, whatever this, but they're not at all. They're, they're good. They did. Um, they did a good job in, in letting uh, Leslie and Ralph publish their article. He, the, this, is, uh, this is a good sign. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and then, okay. So as if that, that wasn't uh, enough, I'm talking about David Grush and, mm-hmm. and, and uh, Washington DC and, and their play in all of this, that's what has been elevated. And Stephen Greer uh, did his presentation today right. at the National Press Club. It was, uh, I think it was three hours, four hours <clears throat> long. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the focus um, on it now. Uh, so I think he brought up six, I think it's three and three on both sides of him, the podium in the middle. Mm. Um, I have, I have the names and everything. We don't have to get into too much. Yeah. I'm just going to be very upfront here. So I've not seen the press conference. I do have notes here and my amazing wife has given me screenshots of his conclusions. (laughs) So I have that here. Uh, looks like he has 12 basic conclusions. Uh, most of them, I think he's, he's on the mark. I think on one, he is really dangerously wrong. Very like dangerous. Okay, uh, let, let's circle back to that. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, um, this is, this is the point. This is the national press club. Yeah. And at the end mm-hmm. of uh, the presentation, there was about 15 minutes of questions, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. There wasn't one national media outlet there. There was not and not to, uh, I listened to everybody ask their question. Billy Carson got a question in. He was there. <laughs> that was pretty cool. Uh, that's great. Uh, but um, uh, the um, uh, this is the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. Now, yeah. you know that uh, uh, Greer and his team invited all of the national media. Yes, undoubtedly. Right? I haven't seen anything uh, uh, reported on it yet. Maybe we will tomorrow. Well, but, how can there be if they don't have any representatives down there to cover it, right? Yeah, yeah. But what? I, I'm just, I'm just surprised uh, about that. It goes back to what we're talking about with Grush too, as well. Um, or is it well, just? Well, think about where he is. It's, it's in D.C. Yes. So, of course, you got the Washington Post there, which might as well just be called the CIA Post frankly. So they're, they're, you know, total DC inside publication. They're deeply in bed with the U S government. So, and they, they, I don't think they said they passed on Leslie and Ralph's story, but they said what we need more time to fact check it, whatever. And they were just 
apparently dragging their feet on it. So they're they've and the Washington Post has never been friendly. Yeah, but all of the all of the networks are broadcasting live from Washington D.C. all day long. They've got their correspondents, they've got their news vans, they've got their newsrooms. Everybody is represented in Washington D.C. And uh, is yeah, it, sure, is, sure. Right. Is it is it ET overload? Is what I'm getting at, right? <laughs> so you have Grush last week, and then rolling into this week, is it is it just too is it too much aliens all the time right now. I think I think our um, our society places a lot of emphasis on official, uh, like official status. So a guy like Grush, you know, I mean, they're in love with Intel guys. They're in love with military guys, you know, especially Intel. They just love that. So, and and he also was part of the UAP task force for for two years. So Grush really had very good official bona fides and credentials to, on his behalf. Uh, Stephen Greer, I mean, he's a medical doctor and I'm not taking anything away from him, but he's, he's not an insider. He's not anyone really important in the grand Washingtonian scheme of things. They're not going to give him all that much credit. I mean, you know, look, I, I went to, um, how many press conferences did Stephen Bassett organize that I attended <laughs> all of those X conferences from 2004 to 2010, and uh, then we did the citizen hearing on disclosure in 2013. Uh, these were huge things. They got a little bit of Washington Post mocking us, you know, smearing us. Uh, there was really never any friendly press coverage there. So that actually doesn't surprise me. Although I, I hear where you're coming from. Like you'd think with the news of the last week that the news media would be Curious. You know what? What you know? Uh, uh, Tim Burchett couldn't come and hang out, and then comment later uh, yeah. about it. Andre Carson, you know the uh, Gillibrand w w w was she and I'm sure they were all invited. Um, uh, why? Well, did if, you're, if you're one of those people, you're probably thinking, uh, "I don't want to get too associated with this." Like I'm sure they're thinking that. Like this would be if if Gillibrand went. If Mark Marco Rubio went, if Tim Burchett went, uh, that would be headline, massive headline. That's what I'm saying. Now, right? uh, here's who spoke. That's making a statement. He had a uh, retired Colonel uh, Donald Hackard from the United States Air Force. Um, hmm. He had uh, Michael Herrera, uh, a Marine Corps veteran, a very effective speaker. He had Steve. Uh, Digna, U.S. Army, uh, Raytheon, um, D.C. Long, U.S. Army. He had Eric Hecker from Raytheon. And then he had his attorney, uh, Derek uh, Garcia, speak to as well about pursuing RICO charges against uh, the United States government, uh, which I thought was actually a, a, a pretty interesting point uh, that was brought up with all of this. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, now my a couple of my takeaways. Now I want to hit you with this. Um, uh, Digna talked about his time in Antarctica, um, and I'll have to go back and look at my notes and things. But it just I, I I believe he said he was there for a year uh, around 2010, and for Raytheon. Okay, so he yeah. goes down there, and I I don't have uh, the specific. He goes to a, a facility that has been built, and to 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 work, but apparently, um, uh, and I'm not going to get into the technical mm -hmm. side of this, but there uh, were these individual cells projecting um, energy. Um, up and I uh, think that uh, a thousand of these individually, but combined, we're talking about something with a lot of whomp to it. Uh, directed energy weapon beam, um, uh, he said it was faster than the speed of light communication, uh, out of, out of Antarctica, uh, out of Antarctica. Yeah. And he said that um, uh, it's fully functional. Mm -hmm. And so the day came uh, for them to flip the switch, right, and turn this thing on. They tested it twice. And that caused an earthquake. I think it was Indonesia. I can't remember. A, a major earthquake that day. 
And that's how much energy that this thing can create. And um, they he had some photographs of it. It was uh, now that part of this testimony today, if true, um, uh, and these kinds of statements, Antarctica is supposed to be the free zone, right? But also, nobody's allowed down there. So, we right. don't know. <laughs> so there are no very, checks. very controlled conditions. Very controlled. There's no checks and balances uh, when it comes to Antarctica. Uh, but that that statement from him out of it was a, it was a good it was a good uh, presentation today uh, by the witnesses. But but that alone stood out for me. And and what do you make of that? Of of a faster than light communication device, and and why would they, why why would we have it unless we need to communicate with ET? Yeah, I I look, I mean, I can't uh, stay one way or the no- or another whether I think this is true. I think it could be true. I I think it absolutely could be true, and and frankly, there have been uh, scientists who have been studying. Uh, all kinds of out there communication systems since at least the 1960s. Um, I'm thinking of a, of, of a science writer, a, a, a scientist named Gerald Feinberg, who was a transhumanist futurist from the 60s, friend of Edgar Mitchell's actually, who I think was studying, uh, was it tachyon based communications, like interstellar type communications back in the 60s. Um, I think this has been something that we've been looking at for a while. So it wouldn't, that wouldn't shock me. The important thing would be how can the information be supported in terms of evidence that people can examine? That's always what it comes down to. So, and it's the same applies to David Grush, you know, frankly, though I think Grush seems to be in a, a better position in terms of being able to provide that evidence, even though we haven't seen it. I think he's been in a good position that, Apparently, he has provided at least some of it to the inter- inspector general. But for these witnesses with uh, Stephen Greer, I, I don't know. And I I feel like it would be irresponsible for me to say, you know, what I think, how strong their arguments are. I need I need to look at this. This just happened today. This is brand new. And uh, I apologize to all the listeners that I, I haven't seen this one yet. I've just I've got notes. That's the best I can do at this time. But I will say from Greer's conclusions. Overall, I think what he says is very much in line with what we have heard earlier this week from people like David Grush. It's not that radically different. He's saying this is I'm looking at his two slides. where He's got 12 conclusions, two primary types of UAP, extraterrestrial vehicles and man-made ARVs or electrogritic propulsion vehicles. I don't think anyone disputes that. I think when you look at the research over the last many decades, yes, exactly. Uh, there was a question that was gave, given to the late Ben Rich of Lockheed Skunk Works by um, John Andrews, who was an associate of his. And John was like, are these ours or theirs, Ben? This is a question of going back decades, decades, decades. So Greer says that. and But here's where I think, uh, I just think what Stephen Greer says is actually truly dangerous. And, and he states that extraterrestrial groups are not hostile to earth or humanity. However, they are increasingly concerned about human hostility and weapon systems such as nuclear scale or et cetera. Look, I'm not saying that human beings are, uh, are the good guys here either. We are a problem. We are a problem species in more ways than one. I'm absolutely. But there have been statement after statement, rumor after rumor for decades and decades that at least one group is absolutely malevolent and hostile to us. And I'm not prepared to throw that out. And also I'm not prepared to throw out the, the extensive research of some of those abduction researchers like Dr. David Jacobs. Some people love what he does. Some people hate what he does. My opinion is that he has enough testimony and evidence that he has amassed from the people that he has worked with in terms of hypnotic regression that at least should cause us pause and concern as to what is going on in terms of hybridization, infiltration of our society by at least one of these groups. And I just, I think it is, I mean, if something like that is going on, 
Like, let's just say that's happening because frankly, there are reasons to think it might be. It's not outrageous. You got aliens here. Do you, do you think aliens coming here are going to be just blase about the fact that we're about to go into an AI singularity? You think right. they're just not going to care about that? You think, right. uh, I think they would. But the point is, if that's going on, if you've got at least one group that's a malevolent, like, infiltration operation, let's just say, then you get a guy like Greer saying, oh, no, they're all good. They don't mean us any harm. That's dangerous. To make that kind of a statement, a blanket statement, which he has done for years. Yep. All right. Now, he has said many things that are on point. I will absolutely acknowledge that. But this one thing that he says, I I think we have we have got to just say no. I'm going to call BS on this. And it's it's worse than BS. It's dangerous. We are not in a position where we can just say, oh, yeah, we have nothing to worry about from them. I will say there are many interactions that have been reported that do seem benign. They seem perfectly fine. There, there are, there's someone or there's groups out there that are do not mean us harm. I, I think that is true, but there is no way in hell I'm going to, uh, you know, tra traipse along and say, oh yeah, they're all good and it's a wonderful universe out there. We're the only bad people. Do you, do you think? I mean, think about this. If these beings evolved on another planet, if they're from some other planet somewhere else. If they are truly extraterrestrial, that means that they, like us, were apex predators. In That's their right. hundred percent. Right? They they, they dominated kicked, their planet. They they kicked ass. And, That's and right. Teams. Yeah. Because they, like us, discovered the secret of science and rationality and logic, and they started to they got the keys to the kingdom, which is science, and they dominated yes. all the other species on their yes. planet, guaranteed. Yes. And even if they're not violent now. Guarantee you, they're used to getting their own way. Oh yeah, they're used yep, to getting yep. their way. Yep, 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 yep. They they have gone through the same mature uh, mm -hmm. maturity and and evolution processes that we have. That's they, right. So they, they 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 had a band called Van Halen. I, I'm sure <laughs> it, it, not as good as ours. <laughs> <laughs> but but they they I hear they, you though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The theater, the arts, um, uh, politics, uh, uh, anger, war, murder. I think all of that would be. Yes, I, I believe I now believe this has been a real growing interest of mine for years. Like I'm looking I've really been looking into human origins, human evolution, early human society, prehistory, all of it. It just fascinates me. I've gone so far into it and I have come to feel that the process that we humans have gone through um, actually makes perfect sense and that I can easily see variations of what we have gone through happening elsewhere on, a, on other worlds. So that, in other words, uh, aggression, mm -hmm. collaborative, cooperative violence, which is what we have always excelled at, really? which in fact has driven our technological development. Mm -hmm. Warfare, like it or not, is one of the key drivers of how we are able to have this very conversation right now. That's right. That's a fact. And so for an, an alien species or an extraterrestrial species to achieve highly advanced technology, you have to ask yourself, did they do this all as a peaceful society? Really? Right. right. I don't think so. Right. I just, I don't think so. And that doesn't mean that they're out to put us in a, in their cookbook, the, now, nowadays, or I don't know what they're trying to do, but they they have their own volition. And that may be, we may be happy with their volition, but we may not be. But the fact is, we it would be very wise before we make snap judgments about saying they're all, they're all here in, uh, in a positive way, which is what Stephen Greer does say. And I just feel like that is, that's just dangerous. That's a dangerous statement. And he, he really, I've never understood this, except, uh, you know, I read his autobiography years ago and he has all these spiritual experiences. He's talked about, he levitated when he was like, what, 17. And he mm -hmm. called in the, uh, the, wasn't it the, the 1973 wave of sightings that, like that was him because he was just too awesome. And he didn't realize his powers were so great. He brought them in. This is literally what he says. And right. he 
prevented uh, George Bush Sr. from being assassinated somehow. He spoke with Bill Clinton on the Astral somehow. Like he did all of these, these superhero things. Uh, and that gives him this insight into all of the extraterrestrial species. I mean, like, can we just call BS on this? Are we allowed to do this at this point in time? Because I am. I don't believe a word of that. And so, you know, how does he know that these these species are all good to us? You, how does he know? He, he doesn't. No. And so when he says this, and I mean, you know, I've been harping on this for a while, and I don't want to, we can move on, but this is a, as I said before, it's dangerous. And and he's got a lot of influence and people are, people want to believe that all, you know, like that we're the only bad ones. They want to believe that all the space brothers are here to help us and to elevate us and bring us to the next density, whatever you want to call it. That's, this is another sign of the rampant utopianism that permeates and has toxified much of our culture and community, not just the UFO field, it's everywhere, but this belief that we're going to achieve all these wonderful things, if only we can just stop being, you know, what we are. Uh, it, I, I it, feel reminds like me, it reminds me of that scene in Independence Day, right? <clears throat> Thing is over Los Angeles and everybody gets on top of the skyscraper, right? And and the ship is opening up on the bottom and the that lady is holding up the sign, you know, welcome to Earth. That's right. That's we right. love you. And she's holding up the sign, and she's so there you go. She's got her, <laughs> <laughs> she's got her tie -tie shirt on and her patchouli. You know, got to have the patchouli. That's important. Very important. She's got her, she's got her pineal gland uh, crystal glued to her head, and boom, the building gets blasted. Right. right. And, and, and I understand your point. People want to believe that and that's fine. I, I get it, but it's a dangerous zone to the universe is built on one basic principle. There's ones and zeros, no positive without a negative, <laughs> no black without a white. Right. And you, that, that, that balance is there. And, and there, you don't have animal species that, that uh, don't eat other species. They, maybe they eat plants, but they eat something. They, they've got to consume. They have to live. They have needs. They have interests. Maybe they're here for baby seals. <laughs> well, there's nothing cuter than a baby seal. I mean, yeah, you got to admit. Cuter. What, wouldn't that just blow Greer's entire uh, scenario if they were here harvesting baby seals? Because that's... That's their favorite well, thing. Let, let but, me just say, there's one other thing. I, I just want to, I don't want to bash Greer. I don't know. Without pointing out that he makes some good points. He does. He does. Right, so he, he just states, uh, I'm looking at the notes. If I just met, he says, extraterrestrial te technology has been studied and reverse engineered, leading to breakthroughs in energy and propulsion. I believe that. I think many people believe that. He goes on. He says, an extremely secret organization has been running these projects without legal constitutional government oversight since the late 1950s. Correct. Uh, I, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about the exact year here, but yes, I agree with that. I think he's exactly right. Yep. And he points he's a lot of these points that like this is an illegal, unconstitutional, wrong, immoral activity. And I agree with that. I think he's he is correct. Um, and, you know, talking about the deep covert nature of this. And look, this is the guy who basically kicked off he got he's the one who got us the davis wilson notes without it without stephen greer we, that would not have happened it was stephen greer in 1997 who was making the rounds in dc talking about black programs that were being ignored uh, that were out of control of the government back then 25 plus years ago so i'm going to give the man that much credit he has been on a path here but it's this obsession with with emphasizing that all of these ETs are beneficent and positive and mean us no harm. I just feel that that is, that's beyond foolishness. It's, it's dangerous, dangerous in the extreme. He and brought I, up, he, he, uh, he, again, we need to, you know, where's the intrepid journalist, right? Uh, but he, he made this point today. 
that we learned to control gravity in 1954. Now, um, bold, bold claim, bold statement, but this is where I'm, I'm, I'm with Greer on this point. Now, I don't know factually, uh, he, you know, he's got an unnamed source, this or uh, Fouche, Fouche, I anyway, it doesn't matter. Edward, not Edgar Fouché. And, uh, he, he's died. He's, uh, yeah, he's yeah, died. Let's, let's let's get away from that for a second. But w- one thing that I do agree with this statement that we uh, learned to control gravity in 1954 is that every company that is was in the technical world was working on that. I, I yeah. mean, that's it. I mean, all the way of every university, every <clears throat> problem, physics, it, it was always about gravity. Now, did we figure it out as early as 1954? Well, I mean, there was a lot of research that was already being applied to that, not only here in the United States, but different countries around the world um, uh, up and, and leading into World War II. We were definitely looking into the uh, to, to control gravity. He says it was 1954. Um, I thought that was a, a, a pretty important point. Do you think that we've had... <clears throat> I think it's possible. It's it's possible. Yes, it's possible. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what his what evidence he's provided that will allow uh, additional independent researchers to to go into it and check it. Um, I mean, this is the problem with claims like this. It's it strikes me as plausible that gravity could have been at least in principle understood that early. I think that is possible, but you know, I mean, there, and there's actually a pretty good circumstantial case that one could make. I mean, as you were pointing out in the, in the early fifties, right up into the mid, I think up to 1956, there were a variety of articles that were written. This is very well known uh, among researchers that were talking about our imminent breakthrough in gravity control. This was absolutely being discussed. And then suddenly it was not being discussed. It just went all went away. It all went dark. Uh, you know, this is during the time when uh, T Townsend Brown, the, the brilliant, Nike. Uh, you know, pioneer of electrogravitics was doing his work and his experiments, something called Project Winter Haven at that time, where he did seem to have the ability to have the, uh, he had this large kind of disc uh, like object uh, attached to a tether. And he applied electrostatic charge, positive and negative, to each of the ends of the disc. And he was able to get that thing to move. And then the US Navy came in and apparently they, he started working for them. And Brown, Brown lived a very good life uh, for the rest of his life. He lived very, very well. And I think he, he did additional work for the, for the, I think the Navy uh, on this matter. So I think electrogravitics would be the most likely key for anti-gravitic type of technology of the 1950s, just because Brown was so advanced in what he was doing. Maybe there's something else going on that, you know, we don't know about. But anyway, yeah, I think it's totally possible. It's just what matters is, is um, did the press conference provide uh, evidence that could be analyzed and studied? And I, I have to plead ignorance here. I don't know if that was done. Well, is it is it is is now the time? Uh, now that Grush has has done his thing and and we've got all of this movement happening in Washington, D.C. and within the Department of Defense, too, as well, and, of course, the intelligence community, we can't leave them out of this picture. Um, is, Is it now time to just start naming names? So when when Stephen Greer steps up to the mic and says, we learned to control gravity in 1954. Okay, well, that, okay. okay. Does the statement need to be Bell Labs learned to control gravity in 1954? And Absolutely. here are the documents. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Is that where Absolutely. we are at? We, we, let's just start to get to the meat of the matter, start naming names, and, 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 and quit fussing about. Well, the real problem, I mean, think about this from an investigative point of view, is how do you get to factual, verifiable data? You know, in, in the case of the people at the press conference, they all have their own particular uh, angle of approach where they where they worked and so on. 
uh, do they have, you know, you said there was a Raytheon guy there. Does, does he have Raytheon documents that he's able to present and say, yes, in 1978, we did this. We were working on this technology that was ET related. Here's the proof. Like that's what needs to be done. Uh, it, it is a good thing that you have verifiable individuals. I assume all of these people can be verified who are willing to go on the record. All of that is good. But from the point of view of a skeptical media, and I think our media is still quite skeptical, they're still very hesitant to go into this story. I mean, I have to think they're going to need a little bit more than that. I mean, even a guy like David Grush, who uh, uh, Tracy was just telling me during the break, in your chat, I think one of the contributors to the chat said that uh, something like there was a conga. Someone said there was a conga line of people willing to support David Grush. Like th that he has tremendous support. But even so, if he doesn't provide, if he can't provide hard data, names even, department names, uh, specifics in one form or another, it's going to be difficult for him to get a lot of forward motion. I could, I, as far as we have come with this, I could see it happening that this could still stall. Even now it's possible it could stall. I mean, is, is being okay. Is it because being on the bigot list is too important for everybody? They don't want to get kicked out of the club. It took a lot of work to get in, you know. And That's a great point. And yes, I agree with that. These guys, they, when you, I, you know, I've, <laughs> I've never been in the military. I'm not in the intel. I've never had a clearance. But uh, I do know those guys and, and women who, who work their tails off to get those clearances. That is not an easy thing to do. You got to go through all the background checks, FBI investigations, like the whole thing. This is an ordeal to get that as a prize. And then to lose it, you lose your clearance. Even if you're not prosecuted, you lose your clearance. Good luck getting work in your industry. So this is very, very important, very coveted. So yes, I think it is fair to say the people who have gone in, who are on those bigot lists. That's the, the list of the insiders in the program. It's very difficult to imagine them wanting to, to risk that. All right, check this out. It's official. There she is. There's my wife's <laughs> biscuit or cake. Ross Colt artist. Oh, Colt Ross has said, thank you, Tracy. There is a conga line of people. I forgot it was Ross willing to vouch for David Grush. There you go. Tracy is the best. Now, a bigot list. Now, before everybody <clears throat> that 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 uh, is going to jump to a conclusion because of uh, what it is called. This was uh, not bigot like you think. Bigot, B-I-G-O-T. Correct. Is uh, World War Two. World War Two. The British. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we're getting ready to uh, to do some stuff, and but it, it was the ultimate in secret information. So to get access to the things that were going on, you had to be added to the bigot list. The it's bigot an acronym. It stands for I can't remember the exact acronym. Do Do you know that? I, I'll give you the acronym right it. now. It's uh, it stands for uh, uh, to Gibraltar. Okay, and so uh, it's a reversal of the co-words to gib, T-O-G-I-B, meaning to Gibraltar. So it's backwards. Oh. Okay, so <laughs> that was the invasion plans. Okay, yeah. so anyway, but uh, it's a list of personnel possessing appropriate security clearance and who are cleared to know details of a particular operation or other sensitive information. And yeah. so the bigot list for something like, okay, I'll give you an example, reverse engineering spacecraft at Lockheed. Right, sure. Junk works. If you are, probably the list that Wilson looked at back in nineteen ninety seven. Right, that's right. That was the biggest list he looked at. So the one. to get on that list, it, it, it's 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 mm. it's background, it's security clearances, but it's also trust. You have mm. to trust. And and one of the things is 
you will never, ever disclose this. Ever. That's it. No That's matter right. what, no matter right. what chips go down, no matter what threats, no matter what happens, right? Your puppies are being killed, but you're not talking. Yeah. And and that's the bigot list. And so to get on that list is for somebody like, uh, you know, to step off of the list and say, okay, I worked at Lockheed Skunk Works. Yes, you know, that is for everybody that has been working in this program, you've now betrayed them. Yeah. And is that list that strong and that powerful? And I'm going to say yes. I think the answer clearly is yes. Mm -hmm. I think so. I think so. A lot, a lot of folks have asked me over the years, why don't one of these insiders just break ranks and, and give up the game and, and name names? And uh, I mean, I'm no expert. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know how a lot of these people think. And I only, I only know a couple of, of, of individuals who are in a position where they might be able to do something like that. And uh, but I do know they're obsessed with their maintaining their security clearances. They're obsessed with it. It means everything to them. So what's next, though? Well, that's I mean, an interesting. Well, maybe the hearings are next. That would be interesting. Um, here's here's something that we need to point out. When Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick was giving his briefing to the the Senate committee just uh, what a month or two ago, you know he he, I think we we can say he effectually lied when he said that the arrow office had no evidence that any of these UAP were extraterrestrial or, you know, along those lines. And he did say that he was very explicit now because you have to, you have to assume he spoke with how many individuals who came to him, who told him what they knew about the inner workings of crash retrieval program, or in the case of Robert Salas, the missiles at Malmstrom being shut down or whatever. Like he was given, I have no doubt he was given a lot of very good information. And yet he goes in front of Senator Gillibrand and says, nope, no evidence that these are extraterrestrial. <clears throat> now it could be that the Arrow office does not have the authority actually to determine if these are extraterrestrial. That's a possibility that that the the authority to determine whether these are extraterrestrial or not might fall to a different group. And in fact, you know, if you remember, Kirkpatrick did hint. This is what the most interesting thing about his, his briefing was when he talked about this other group of senior individuals who received the reports from his office. He mm -hmm. didn't really identify who they were or say anything about them. And there was no follow-up about them. And it was the first time that I'd heard that there was this independent group of senior analysts who looked at the arrow reports. So I don't know who has the authority, but it could very well be that he, he and his office do not have the authority to make a determination that these reports are extraterrestrial. And if that's the case, then he could legally say, we have no evidence that these are extraterrestrial, even though he probably knows damn well that that's the best explanation. So they they were not truthful. And I just think that is important for us to say. I don't think that his office was truthful. But all of those whistleblowers or individuals who came to his office, I, I think it's at least a dozen or maybe 20, right? About 20 people. Well, I think they should be subpoenaed for the hearings. Yeah, he said more more than two dozen. I think is is, is yeah, sounds of, right. Yeah. So I think I think hearings in the next I don't know a couple of weeks, month, what, whatever. This uh, this might be soon. This might be be really soon. And if it is, well, those people all all of them should be subpoenaed to give testimony. Every single one of them. The uh, the the other part with this would. <clears throat> Can we expect to have documents and photographs put in the public record and and shown at the at the hearing at the video? First? I think that would be great. Um, will it happen? I don't know. I don't know what kind of country we would have anymore. Like, is this? Do we have that type of society where these things will make it to the public record? I talked to uh, my friend Steve Bassett. He'll say yes. That absolutely will happen. 
I hope that is true. I don't know. I don't know how this it, it, the, the protocols it, of these hearings. Right, right. If you're Marco Rubio, right? I, I'm just using Marco as an example. Um, but mm -hmm. if you're Marco Rubio, you're chairing the committee and you're staring, you know, at your witness. And, uh, and in this case, it's David Grush. And you go, okay, all right, it's a good story. You got a picture, right? And, and, and as a matter of fact, I do. Right. And, 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 and do we see that? Is that under seal or, you know, and, and, and this hearing, is it public? Uh, are they going to do this behind oh, that's a, that's closed a good door? question. That's a good question. I, you know, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, and your other question, that's very on point. Like, well, uh, because, I mean, clearly a lot of this information has been classified, we have to assume. And so the question will be, you, I don't, I mean, Again, this is not my expertise in any way, but I'm going to assume that the hearing does not have the authority simply to declassify documents willy nilly. I mean, do they have that ability? I'm thinking probably not, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they have, they can do that. But if it's classified, then in a public hearing, I would have to assume those types of documents might not see the light of day. Your uh, the second point in uh, AD after disclosure, which you and I have discussed over the years many many times, but I something like this, right? Some USB disk, right? mm -hmm. <laughs> some terabyte SSD USB, crazy. Something like that is going to pop. It's it, there. I, I just don't think that there is a way to keep everything. It was it, it was easier 25 years ago. It was easier 50 years ago. It's a different world. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is something again when we wrote AD. One of one of the biggest reasons I used I for years I would say disclosure is a paradox. It's impossible and it's inevitable. It's both. It, it's I always said it was impossible because. You can really never see the motivation for, let's say, the powers that be to give this up voluntarily. There's just too much for them to lose and too much for them to gain if they keep the secret to themselves. That I can understand. But I always felt there was an inevitability to the ending of UFO secrecy simply because of the nature of the world we now live in. And partly it, it's the web, you know, it's the interconnectivity that we all have. I mean, again, we wrote this in 2009 and 2010 when. The web still did, seemed like a very free place and there was not these uh, parameters that are being placed on it to, to guard us against ourselves. But even so, I do think there's enough pressure coming up from below, from the people to potentially force this issue open. I, and I do think that that remains a possibility. Uh, we have a lot stacked against us. We should really not lose sight of that. Um, we've got a very, very powerful, centrally established group of people. They control the global finance. They control the political systems. They control the media. They control big pharma. They can. They control pretty much everything. And you know, and they are the technocrats who are creating a technocracy to rule this world. That's what they're doing. Is the petrodollar too uh, uh, too big of a deal? No, right. no, the petrodollar is getting in trouble. <laughs> and it's, well, not it, 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 it's not what it was in 1974. That's for, it's not what it was two years ago. Two years ago, yeah. Um, it, it's in real trouble. Most, most people don't understand, Richard. They don't understand that every barrel of oil sold on this planet, no matter who or what, we make money on the United States. Yeah. That's called the petrodollar. That's it. This is and, all the, the decline is due to utterly, I mean, we're out of time, but reckless, reckless policies by the United States government over the last two years, particularly in the realm of international relations. There has never been, I know you don't want to hear politics, but there has never been such deep, deep incompetence and criminal negligence in U.S. foreign relations as we have seen in these last two years. Well, never it, 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 not it, in all it, of American it, history. If disclosure happens, mm -hmm. the Stephen Greer version, the the Grush version, my version, yeah. your version, whatever. If it happens, um, the petrodollar. I, I don't know if we are 
completely aware of what that would do to the world economy and to well, the yeah the energy paradigm changes because, because look a, a 10 year old kid who sees a, a zigzagging ufo moving across the sky is going to realize uh whatever is making that thing go it's not gasoline right so it's something a little bit niftier and whatever that is you know when you get disclosure we're going to figure that out niftier we're figure it out it's niftier niftier it's a good it's an old fashioned word yeah it's, that's a good word that's Back a good in word. the day Man, you muck, 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 cracking. Um, but yeah, it, 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 you, you need to be really careful about what you wish for. But the yeah. it, the the other side of it is uh, there could be, um, and it, the, my take is, and, and then we'll wrap this up. Is I think that Washington knows something. And they know something's about to break that is out of their control. There may be a fleet of stuff on its way here, and they know about it, and it's going to arrive in two years or whatever. Maybe they know something like that, that something is inevitable. And you got to rip off that Band-Aid. And and maybe that's that's what's in play here. And so the world economy and everything else, uh, they've they've got something uh, in the works. Here's some here's a thought. And I'm not I'm not going partisan one way or the other. But if you want to look at like Joe Biden's reelection chances, all right, this guy, he's got some trouble. He's got some real negative reviews. Everyone knows he's not really all, not all there and all, a lot of bad things going on. And no one likes the vice president uh, candidate to replace him. She's even less popular. Uh, and no one knows what's going to happen with Trump. Is, is he going to be able to run or are they going to lawfare him to death or whatever's going on? But and, and you know, the, the current military escapades in Ukraine are not going well from a Western point of view. We'll just leave it there. So with all of that happening. If you're on the team to reelect the current president, I actually wonder, are they thinking of playing this card? Right. I, I mean, yeah, I it know seems, it seems know. insane. It seems crazy, but <laughs> I, you got to wonder. You got this to. could be like a political gift for them to take this bull by the horns, as it were, and say, "Yep, it's real." But of course, that. The problem with that is, God Almighty, like the the questions, the the Pandora's box that is opened up as a result is has only been written about once, and that was by myself and Bryce Zabel in our wonderful book AD After Disclosure. <laughs> but we what we saw was potential pandemonium. I mean, just not people running around in the streets, that type of thing, but a a social and political and intellectual revolution definitely happening in, in the world and the results of which are not easy to predict. And that's not, that's not good. If you're, if you're at the top of the power pyramid, you don't want things to be shaken up that much because that's, that's when things can change against your interests. You mean I lost my house and my car because I couldn't pay my gas and electric bill and you had free energy for the last 80 years? You don't think oh, yeah. there's going to be some pissed off people? Class option lawsuits. Woo, I, I remember hearing years ago, Linda Moulton Howe going off on, she's saying, you know, think about the airline industry, all the energy and fuel that they waste. And if there was a better solution, and I thought, you know what? You're right. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, areas for angry, you know, uh, torches in the street, pitchforks coming after the, the powers that be over this lie. And then we haven't even gotten into abductions. No, we have. You're, uh, you know, we don't, I know we don't have time, but the the, the issues never end with this subject. That the structure of the to me that it's been the structure of the secrecy that's been my number one thing. It's like, how have you kept this secret for so long? How have you perverted and damaged our institutions that we hold so sacrosanct? Because you know what? Here's the thing: uh, I'm not interested in disclosure within a fascist totalitarian technocracy. I'm not interested. I'm interested in disclosure within a free society, which is what I was born into, at least what I thought I was born into. And so I want 
uh, I want to know why this secret destroyed the republic I was I thought I was born into. I'd like to know. What happened to the academic institution? How were they just so diverted from their cause of looking into the truth? Because they were, and they were manipulated by the intelligence community. Everyone knows that. Same with the media, which is supposed to be the watchdog of the public in a functioning democratic society, which we know was just thrown you know, overboard back in the 1940s at the latest in terms of freedom of inquiry and all that. I mean, they've just betrayed us. They've betrayed their ideals. That's what the UFO secret did. It, it wrecked the American dream. The Betty and Barney Hill movie hmm. and project um, yeah. has been green lighted by Netflix. Guess whose production company is oh, doing it? That's Barack Obama, right? Yeah, Barack yeah. and Michelle hmm. Obama. Isn't that yeah. interesting? Yeah. Richard. When do you put out? Do you, do you have a new show out tomorrow? Is it Tuesdays or Wednesdays? Yeah, no, it's Tuesdays. And um, <clears throat> I actually did an interview for it, but I think I'm going to put that off later in the week, and I'm going to I'm going to do something solo for tomorrow. Okay, break right. down uh, everything that's been going on. You know, it's kind of annoying. It's a lot of work. I don't like all this extra work. I I just want to go back to writing my uh, my current book project, but. Hey, history has intervened. We're seeing <laughs> history in the making. And I've got to like, okay, we've got to divert ourselves and we really have to look at this carefully because what is happening now is important. It's very significant. And um, it's important that we understand it. It's important for me that I understand it properly. And um, and I hate, you know, I mean, I never like commenting on things right away. I'm, I'm just not that kind of a person. Other Other people have no problem with it. But for me, I like to take my time. I like to reflect. I don't like to just jump in and have some kind of snap conclusion. The problem is when you're a public person in this field, people want you to have an opinion right away. But it's important for me to, um, I just want to be measured. I just want to be careful and get my facts straight. So I think I will have something uh, fresh for tomorrow. That's my plan. You're the best, Richard. Give my best to Tracy. Just thank you so much. I know we ran a little bit over tonight. Uh, we've left a lot on the table. We could have kept this going for the next five, six hours. Jimmy, I love my interviews with you. You, I, I always enjoy them. Honestly, I just think you do a great job in interviewing me. You get things out of me that uh, well, don't usually come out. So that's good. Uh, Johnny Nash. That's what I got out of you today. Oh my goodness. What a beautiful song, isn't it? It's oh, from an era where people really were optimistic. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. Bright, sunshiny day. I mean, my God, if, if, if you don't like that song, then there's something wrong with you. I mean, it's just a beautiful, upbeat, perfect song. When One of my favorites. And I got to hear it. Starts, doom, 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 yeah. Bah. You're, you're just it's wonderful. Ready. You're ready to go. It's a wonderful song. Have a good night, Richard. Thank I'll you, talk to you, my friend. Thank you so much. I'll okay. call you tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Bye, Fader Nuts and uh, anyone else out there. Yeah. Richard Bleep and Dolan. Thank you, Richard. Perfect show tonight. Thank you, everybody. I am going to jump straight out of here. I realize that uh, we ran over um, tomorrow night. Let's see here. Tomorrow night. Uh, let's see. Oh, tomorrow, Dr. John Brandenburg is going to be with us. We're going to be talking about the life and death on Mars. All of that is tomorrow night. Thank you, Richard. It has been uh, one of the craziest weeks that I can that I can remember in a very, very, very long time, and uh, very exciting. And I agree with Richard. Next. The hearings, UFO hearings, real ones, flying saucers, alien bodies. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you to Dennis and Kevin, Webmasters, Drew the Geek, Music, Doug Aldrich, Intro, Space Boy, SpaceBoyMusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR with the Game Changer Network. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted. 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with John Brandenburg, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy. Go back, Lee Tappy.
Yeah, 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 yeah.